And something in my head was just like, beat their ass. Right now, on live TV. And then the other side of my brain was like, yeah, beat their ass. You should beat their ass. Welcome to This Is Not Happening. I'm your host, Roy Wood Jr. We live in uncertain times. Sometimes the Wi-Fi is no good. Sometimes your condom breaks. The important thing to remember is that Plan B is affordable. reality television pretty much any show where somebody's dreams are getting crushed <laughs> set DVR record series <laughs> doesn't matter what the show is I want to see pain as long as somebody somebody gonna cry all right I'm gonna watch it I would watch cooking if there wasn't an elimination element to cooking I would care, care less about cooking but now you're telling me one of the chefs is gonna be chopped oh okay uh -oh. <laughs> Every commercial break, they got three chefs face to face. So you ever, I don't know if you ever watched Chopped, but it's three, four chefs, and every commercial break, the dream is crushed. It's the best of all the reality shows. Cause you get three fucking people crying every episode. It's beautiful, it's just some dude in the hallway crying cause he put too much paprika on a duck leg. And he shook, he's in the hallway, and just, you know, I'm gonna come back next year, and I'm gonna do it, and I'm just, focus and I just know I can do the gorgonzola better <laughs> and I'm sitting at home with an erection like yes <laughs> cry bitch cry <laughs> you knew paprika don't go with duck leg <laughs> <laughs> I love it crush these dreams I just love the titles I love the titles of reality shows they just challenge people the title is a challenge. Oh, are you smarter than a fifth grader? Are you, are you smarter? But, oh, 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 you think you can dance. This motherfucker think he can dance. Oh, so you think you can dance? He think he can dance. You can't dance, get your ass out here and dance. For as long as the title is a challenge, I promise you it would get top ratings. I'm pitching a show to Comedy Central. It's just called, oh, so you think you can do narcotics? <laughs> With the stars, that's what I'm pitching. With the stars, you, you shoot up and then you have to dance with the star. And whoever doesn't pass out, you win. You go to the next round. Tuesdays after Broad City. Or whatever night Broad City comes on, I don't know. Fix it in pickups. I feel like I've earned the right to laugh at other people's pain on reality television because I've had my guts ripped out on national television repeatedly. Got booed in a Showtime at the Apollo. I lost a couple seasons, The Last Comic Standing. The worst one, the worst gut ripping for me was 2003, the Star Search reboot hosted by Arsenio Hall. <laughs> I auditioned for this show and I won the first week, and I can't explain to you the ego boost it is as a comedian to go on television and rip with just your thoughts, just the things that came out of your brain, and to stand there and deliver them and have them be loved by the judges and the people voting at home. It's the highest of highs. So I'm going into that semifinal week. I'm arrogant. I'm like in, in my trailer. I'm walking around. I got all my jokes printed out, and I got a highlight. I'm just picking jokes. I mean, yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna do that joke, and I'm gonna hit him with this joke. Oh, no, yeah, I'm gonna hit him with the Hulk Hogan. That's, that's what's gonna get him. Do that Hulk Hogan. Oh, yeah, brother. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Deck was stacked against me. Celebrity guest judges for my semifinal episode of Star Search was Jay Boog and Raspy from the hit group B2K. <laughs> B2 
B2K, they were the popular boy band at the time. If you don't know who B2K is, it's basically it's like four black ass Justin Biebers and they, <laughs> and they were good. They made boy band music. They did all the girl and you know and my baby hair. It's good music, but I'm nervous because that's not who I write my comedy for. 14 year old millionaires. That's not my target demographic. And I'm nervous. And Arsenio Hall is talking to me before the show. He's all, you got this. You got this. Just focus. Trust the Joe. You got the finger. Arsenio. Yes. It's a cool ass dude, man. Fucking sharp suit and white ass teeth. You got this. You got it. Just focus. Do your jokes. Do your jokes. You got this. I did not got this. <laughs> I go on stage in front of 8.3 million Americans, according to Nielsen Research, and I proceed to lay the biggest turd ever shit on the CBS network. Judges rip me. I do the Hulk Hogan joke. Oh, yeah, brother. Crickets. And this is the worst part. This is the worst part of bombing on television as a comedian. It's one of the few entertainment disciplines where you have proof of concept before you do the show. If you're cooking, they may fuck you up with an ingredient you've never seen before. If you're dancing, they may give you a discipline of dance you've never done before. But these jokes, bitch, I've been doing them. They was working. <laughs> Hulk Hogan been getting laughs. So you go on stage in front of 8.3 million Americans, according to Nielsen Research, and the joke bombs, you're standing there like, what the fuck just happened? And now you have to go stand next to the host and face the judges, because now the judges get to tell you why the joke didn't. Bitch, I know it didn't work. I was just standing there. I'm aware that I was not funny just now. I know I was not funny. I don't need to stand here and have Naomi Judd tell me why I'm not funny. <laughs> she was one of the judges, Naomi Judd. Naomi Judd shit on me. Ahmet Zappa shits on me. Only person who kept it real was my nigga Ben Stein. Ben Stein. Yo, Ben Stein gave me three stars out of five just because he knew what I was capable of. I just didn't do it tonight. And I respect that. I always respect that about Ben Stein. I'll never forget. Yo, when the race war start, I'm protecting Ben Stein. <laughs> I am. I ain't gonna let no black people hurt Ben Stein. I'm like, yo, man, this motherfucker gave me three stars. <laughs> He's good. We get to B2K. And they just chilling. Like, they just chilling. They slouched in the damn chair. So I already know it's about to be the bullshit. And you rubbing their little goatee in. I would give you zero stars, but ain't no button for that one. And something in my brain click. <laughs> something in my brain click. These 14 year olds just crushed my ego in front of 8.3 million people, according to Nielsen Research. <laughs> and something flipped in my head. These 14 year olds just crushed my dreams. And something in my head was just like, beat their ass. <laughs> <laughs> Right now, on live TV. <laughs> just walk over there, it's not far, walk over there and just beat their ass. And then the other side of my brain was like, yeah, beat their ass. <laughs> you should beat their ass. <laughs> so in my head, I'm like, cool, you know, just gotta beat their ass. They only 10 feet away, the judge's chairs are not far. It's two steps and a choking, I can get there. <laughs> And as I go to lift my leg, I go to lift my first leg off the ground to go and assault two 14-year-olds on national TV. As I go to lift my leg off the ground, Arsenio Hall, smooth as shit, grabs me by the back of my blazer and just goes, mm 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 Saved my whole career. Cause I was on him and he knew, cause he's black, he's got the instinct. He saw the tremble. And he knew I was about to go over there and put hands on them boys. He's like, mm -mm -mm. I get eliminated, we go to commercial break, and Arsenio, as they're walking me off the stage, gives me some of the best advice that I've ever, ever gotten. It's pretty much the only conversation I've ever had with the dude. He said, everybody will forget a bad joke, 
nobody will forget a bad attitude. And I carried that with me the rest of my days. And I, and I told them, thank you. I said, I appreciate that, man. I still want to beat their ass. <laughs> But I'm going to let it slide for now. My ego was crushed. So I go back to my trailer and I begin the process of evaluating what went wrong. Because as a comedian, you have this joke that has worked in the clubs and then you do it on TV and it fails. Now you've got to break down how this joke failed. What happened? I did, oh yeah, brother. I did the Hulk Hogan part, right? (laughs) Did I not pause? Was I working too fast? Why didn't this joke work? And because this joke betrayed me at the pinnacle of my career at that time, I couldn't do the joke anymore. So I stopped doing the Hulk Hogan joke because what's the point of doing it if I can't do it on TV? When I do it on TV, it fails. So it doesn't matter what it does in the clubs. I quit doing the joke. And I talked to my friend John Heffron. John Heffron, great comedian from Detroit. He was also on the episode with me. He got eliminated too. So we're both in full fuck B2K mode. (laughs) Two grown men versus two 14 year olds. Like we are furious. So we go to a bar on Sunset. I'm not gonna name the bar because I don't know if they pay for advertising. So, so we go to a bar in Hollywood and we just get shit face drunk on tequila. And then right across from this bar is an Amoeba Records. It's a huge used record store and DVDs and all that. One beautiful store. And I decide to go on Amoeba Records, and I go to the R&B section, (laughs) and I gather every B2K CD that I can find, and I go and I hide them in the gospel section of the store. (laughs) You little motherfuckers. Ain't nobody buying your shit at this store. I'm checking the computer. It says we have 48 copies. I don't know why they're not back there. And I know that's petty, but my ego was crushed, man. My soul was crushed. These dudes took a joke from me that I couldn't do anymore. So I had to hide your shit. And what? (laughs) And so what happened over the next two years was me, anytime I was in any record store in America, I would just hide B2K CDs. <laughs> Didn't matter where I was, Best Buy, Circuit City back in those days, and I would just hide your shit. I'd put it under a refrigerator. I'd... <laughs> like somewhere in a Circuit City or a Best Buy, there's a dude that just found two B2K CDs underneath the couch in the surround sound section. <laughs> And it's not stealing, I didn't deface the property, I just relocated it, so it's not a crime. Those were the little petty things I did because they shitted on me on national TV in front of 8.3 million Americans according to Nielsen Research. And it didn't stop there. My battle, my one-way battle with these two teenagers continued for years. B2K didn't know. This is what B2K didn't know about me. B2K didn't know that I was the morning show producer of the number one hip hop morning show in the state of Alabama. And if you don't know anything about radio, know this. The morning show producer is there first. He's there before anybody else gets in the building. It's my job to set up all the stories for the day and get a shape of the show and do prep on the guests. But more importantly, it's the morning show producer's job to manage the music log, to make sure that there is enough songs set for every hour so that we have enough songs to play during the show. Every morning for four years after I got eliminated off Star Search. <laughs> I would walk into 95.7 Jams in Birmingham, Alabama, and I would pull up the music log for the morning, and anywhere there was a B2K song that showed up in our music log, I clicked and I dragged that shit to the recycle bin. (laughs) You little motherfuckers! 